Okay, so I'm Brian Cardell from Egalia, and this is part four in a series on web ecosystem health. Place for us to talk about complex and nuanced, very under-discussed things about the web and the web platform and web standards, how we manage to keep them healthy as they are and hopefully improve their status in, instead of its decline. And the fact that it is actually rather complicated, we tend to simplify it into how many rendering engines do we have? And uh, there's a lot more to it than that. So I've been inviting different people on to talk to me from different backgrounds and different perspectives. And uh, I'm really pleased to have another guest here today. Dan, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, Brian. And thanks for um, asking me to, to come on and talk to you about this stuff. It's a very interesting topic. Um, so my name's Dan Applequist. I work for Samsung. I work lead the uh, web developer advocacy group uh, that's part of Samsung Internet. I should probably introduce that Samsung Internet is a very widely used browser uh, in the Android ecosystem. It's the browser that ships with Samsung phones. It is a Chromium-based browser. Samsung, unlike other OEMs, is an organization that contributes back into Chromium, and we do an awful lot of contribution back into open standards as well. So, and, and, and my team is a team that does developer outreach and developer advocacy work. And as part of that work, we also do standard. Uh, we consider the standards work to be part of our work, and we are part of the engineering group for Samsung Internet. Personally, I'm somebody who has been involved in the web standards world for a lot of years. Probably the early 2000s is when I got involved in W3C uh, initially, and I've been a representative to W3C for a number of different companies, including Vodafone and Telefonica at various times in my career. Going back a little bit further in time, I started a company uh, that was working on web publishing. This was back in mid nineties, uh, when a lot of people didn't know what the web was. So I've kind of grown up with the web. Um, that was maybe my second job. And that company was doing a lot of work with, um, scientific, technical, medical publishers. So our big claim to fame was that we put the journal nature online. And I subsequently then went to go work for, uh, some dot-com companies in particular, I worked for the street.com in New York. Then in, at the end of the last century, uh, they sent me to London to be CTO for the street.co.uk, um, which was going to be the UK division of the street.com. Subsequent to that, we had the dot-com bust and I got stranded over here in London. So I've been living in London with my family for 20 years now. That has given me a very interesting international perspective as well. Having being a U.S. citizen, U.S. person, who and now a dual national, I've done a lot of work, you know, with European organizations and also Asian uh, as well. Obviously, with Samsung, this gives me a little bit of, I think, an interesting perspective to bring from a global point of view. There are some other things in here that also give you an interesting perspective, Dan. So we've known each other for a long time. And in that story that you just told, the companies that you're associated with, they sort of always were involved in the web somehow, but yeah. also they had a, they had a sort of a connection to a web engine. Yeah. 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 I, I did a lot of work. A lot of the work that I've been doing, Samsung, at least initially was kind of setting out our stall. And, and also making it clear that, that we're a different browser, even though we're Chromium based and are part of the Chromium ecosystem, we're also, we also take our own decisions. We make our own decisions about features and we have our own opinions about things. Um, I should also say that in my work in standards, one of the things that I've been doing for the past, I guess, 2013 is co-chairing something called the technical architecture group in W3C, which is something I've been very privileged to have been appointed by Tim Berners-Lee to do. And that has been, I think we've, we've taken that group through a kind of renaissance that you were involved, Brian, and made it a lot more relevant, I think, to the modern web or to what more most people think of as the modern web, as a kind of review group, as a design authority, um, and as a group that plays a very positive role, I think, in the in the uh, the ongoing development of new specs, new standards, um, and the way that, that new technologies are brought to them. That's something that I definitely... So if you're not familiar with 
the W3C Technical Architect or TAG, TAG. as we're referred to, uh, is one of two elected bodies in the W3C. It's a very small number of people, uh, mostly elected people, uh, some appointed people as well. Those people are appointed historically by Tim Berners-Lee. It is tasked with sort of overviewing the broad vision and architecture and health of the web for a very long time. I mean, not a year, not next year, not in the next two or three years, but how does this look in 50 years? Uh, yeah. Which is a, actually a very difficult thing. And historically, uh, when it was formed, it was there was a lot of excitement about it, but it sort of receded into the background for a little while. And I think since, Dan, you have been a co-chair there have been like a lot of really positive developments. It is yeah. no longer that way. Uh, it is engaged. It is active. And I think one of the most positive things is really intangible here, which is that you go and talk to people. Yeah. I think that the value in that is really, really important. I know that you've had a number of times when the the whole tag or parts of tag have organized meetups around your meetings? Yeah, obviously we're not doing that now, but but in general, uh, when we have been meeting, uh, we took the opportunity to engage with the web developer community. Uh, and in some cases we ran evening events, in some cases we ran all day workshops where we had additional people from the web community, uh, the web standards community. I, I have a kind of general feeling that web standards are better when there's more engagement between the web standards and the general web developer community. Yeah, I think absolutely. And and for, I think that that sort of thing helps the discourse, which I think you can't actually overstate the value of somehow being able to act together as a very diverse community that we are like the people that use the web is everybody yeah frequently we have like our own bubble one of the things that i think is kind of interesting here is uh i i did a poll recently yeah uh, about the speed of innovation on the web and this actually came from my developer advocacy i talk to a lot of developers and i hear two sets of feedback that are dramatically at odds right um, right one is that things are moving way too fast. And the other is like, things seem to have stopped. What happened? The web used to move and now it just, <laughs> those two positions can like, they can they coexist? Like what, what do people think? I, I never really have. Right. Well, it has to do with where, you know, frame of reference. My take is it's complicated. In, in some areas we're moving quite fast. And in other areas, there are things that we would really like to see move, but they just seem to not move so fast. Right. I, I like to talk about that because frequently they are moving. The results were about a fifth of people thought it's way too fast. And about a fifth of people thought it's way too slow. And everybody else said it's about right or it's complicated. But it's, I mean, I, I think that this is a kind of indication that there is a silent majority here. There are a lot of people who hold um, extreme views, like the web will never be useful to me until I have this technology incorporated into it. And until then you can, you know, forget it. And then people who are like, uh, the web will cease being the web if, if you keep adding new uh, technologies and new um, APIs into it, and then will lose its its essential quality of webbiness. And so I'm not interested, right? And I think that most people are on neither side of that spectrum. I think the thing that your poll and the results of your poll point out is that most people are, are generally okay with the pace of innovation. Um, I think we actually are living through a web renaissance right now. I mean, I think there's never been a time when there has been more focus and energy on new technologies, bringing new ideas, new thoughts, new APIs, and new approaches to the web, both from a design and API perspective and performance uh, point of view, and how that web, how that web platform manifests itself on different types of devices and different modalities of input and output, all that stuff. It's very exciting to be part of the web community right now. And I guess I'm, I'm also, you know, looking at it from the perspective of my long-term point, point of view, right? I saw us live through the web dark ages when, you know, IE6 was the only browser that anybody cared about and uh, dramatically different 
where where we're living now, the environment that we're. I think it's good for web developers and it's good for web users. The dark ages that you mentioned, I think a lot of people on the web today, they, they didn't live through those. So for some perspective, Microsoft Internet Explorer won the web. Uh, they had somewhere upwards of 95% of market share. And the W3C at the same time was sort of into a second system effect. They were looking for the next web. That wasn't a devil, an evolution of the current web. It was the way we'll do it right because we got a lot wrong. Yeah. Uh, in, you know, sort of typical second system of effect, it, it was a real overshoot. But because of that, Microsoft dismissed the IE team. Yeah. So like the one web browser that was used by the vast, vast, vast majority of people had nobody maintaining it really or trying to keep it going or keep it effective, which really just sucked the wind out of everything. Yeah, I mean that is a really good. I, I I think it it is a all the energy was gone from the web, and it took the development of Firefox and the deployment of Firefox to really uh, reignite that. And I think you know that is a lesson that I certainly draw from history. I I, I also am reluctant to apply that lesson too directly to our current. Uh, situation. I think a lot of people uh, love to say things like uh, XYZ is the new Internet Explorer. Uh, Google Chrome is the new Internet Explorer. No, Safari is the new Internet Explorer. And I guess, you know, with the me the meaning being who is holding back innovation on the web, who is causing web developers the most headaches, I think it is a mistake to try and directly kind of bring history forward like that. Um, I, I, however, I do think we can definitely learn some lessons and apply those lessons to the current environment. The initial blog post I wrote that sort of launched this conversation actually made a similar point, which is talking about rendering engine diversity is very incomplete as a measure because yeah. uh, at one point in time, we might have had five rendering engines, but they were dramatically less capable and they were also proprietary. Today, they're all open source. And so the the birth of Mozilla from Netscape yes. as an open source project and KHTML as free software, those had a really healthy impact, I think, because they not only allow companies like Samsung to get in and work on things, but they also provide a case where as the world changes, like th th perhaps this is something that you can actually talk to as your, your long view of the web with CAG. One of the things that I've been talking about here is that if there's a lesson that you can learn from history, it should be more vague and it should be about change is inevitable and the power structures will change and the budgets will change. The energy that a company is willing to voluntarily put can change even if that company itself is actually really behind the ideas. Sure. So, uh, you know, we've seen this in the past with IBM has had to radically change. Motorola has had to radically change, you know, like they have changed as companies and the way that they invest and Microsoft also like Microsoft is a very, very different company than it was. Yeah. Back then. Yeah. The web, the web has to outlive all of that. The web, Absolutely. you know, that's the point. and that's one thing that I'm passionate about. The web, the web has to outlive any individual company, any individual browser, any individual engine. Um, who's to say what we're going to have in 10 years time? Yeah, I think that's absolutely the case. And if you look at every engine that we have right now, we have gotten not through some special act of glorious creation, like all at once, you know, on the sixth day, somebody <laughs> created... Right. But we have gotten there through evolution. Right. We've gotten there through evolution. So even um, the very early browsers were very frequently like Netscape was a rewrite by mostly the same people who created uh, Mosaic. At every stage, you get new people and new ideas and you learn lessons from the past. But, uh, you know, through KHTML, we got WebKit. Through WebKit, we got Blink. Chromium. And the ability for us to take that when should Google, I mean, I know this is, it is inconceivable and yet it will happen, right? Like at, at some point, Google will cease to be the Google that it is today. And like what happens? The open source nature of this ensures that one or more companies can keep that alive and, and, and yes. take over or fork it. And I think that that is 
critically important difference between the web today and the web of the past. Yeah. And it keeps the web. I think one of the things that you, uh, one of the words that you used to describe the web in one of your previous episodes, uh, Brian, was the commons. And I like to think about the web as the commons. The, 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 the value of the web is that it is the commons. It is The value is that it is not dominated by any one particular organization or government, and that it can therefore outlive any one particular organization or group or efforts, uh, software development uh, or contributions. It can continue to evolve as people as people add additional capabilities into it to meet their own needs. And those needs need to be based on user needs. And that's when the web is at its is at its best, is at its, is at its strongest when it meets the needs of the community. Uh, with a large C that includes the developers, the engine developers, the the web developers, the the end users of the web, and it benefits all the organizations that put time and energy into it. Certainly, benefits Samsung, it benefits Google, it benefits Apple, it benefits Microsoft, uh, but it also benefits small companies. I mean, it benefits the restaurant down the street. It benefits the restaurant down the street. So yeah, so like, who are we building the web? Right? Is are we building the web only for is, is it big web? Is it only for big web that we're building the web or is it also for small web? And the things that I think about when I think about big web, big web are big properties like Facebook, for instance. Okay. Facebook is a huge user of the web. It's a very big stakeholder of the web. But I also think about my local barbershop. They have a website um, that lets me log in. I don't need to log in. I just had, I just need to go. That's one of the things I love about it. Actually, I don't log in. I just go to their website I book a slot, my barber that I that I like, plug in my mobile phone number, and they send me a text message and confirm my appointment, and boom. Then the day of, they've got their own admin interface, and they can look at you know who's next and stuff like that, and they don't have to have somebody manning the phone to take appointments all the time. So it really benefits them. It benefits me because I know I can book a slot exactly when I want to with the barber that I want, and it's a very simple web application and enables that small business to do to do the work that that they do think about all kinds of local businesses that depend on the web in that way and i i think the web is at its best when we are really thinking about small web people like e- easy problems and you know if they can look at a a big web user like facebook again right then uh it's it's easy to talk to facebook it's not easy to talk to the long because you know, so that's why I think developer engagement is so much a part of, of what we need to do with web standards, right? Like, um, I remember having these discussions very early on as, after we rebooted the tag with people who were familiar with the way that the old tag worked, where I would be like, okay, well, we're going to have a developer meetup at our next tag. And they would look at me and just, why would you want to talk to developer? Really flummoxed that, <laughs> like... <laughs> and, and to me, that completely misunderstands what the web is for. You know, it's it, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm glad we that we got there in the end. Yeah, I am. I am, too. I have no idea what we're doing in a lot of ways. Like we're, we're doing it for the first time. And like as you do things for the first time, you can expect mistakes. You can expect to learn and, and, and continue to do better. And I think that's like a good gauge of like, are, are we continuing to learn and do better? Like, are we correcting mistakes? Like we're halfway into the into the evolution of the web current 30 years before we specify the html parser so it, for the first half of the web the web parser was not specified and also there were no shared tests like those are huge changes that happened only about halfway through yeah right but they're they're much 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 better and we also uh we work on them together we don't just go and change something we work on them together because we care about interoperability because that's key right like it's really yeah it's one of the things that makes the web different is that it is a standard it, it's not qt or something where you you can kind of do what you want it's multi-stakeholder by nature right and it and i think that's a key part of the definition of what makes the web open i like to talk about transparency of process multi-stakeholder open open availability of standards royalty free these are things that make the web, the foundational technologies of the web open in, in that sense. And that, and that 
keeps them in a level playing field where you can have multiple parties speaking together. We know how things are built. I think the trans- the transparency also comes through to uh, to how you can trace exactly you know all of the contributions and um, and you can know from a tech not from a technical perspective how things are built and also importantly from an intellectual property perspective how things are built so you make sure that the technology that you that you're using is is being offered under a royalty free license all that kind of stuff so it's it's super important sort of a renaissance and how do we include developers that that's a thing that is not unusual in the evolution of standards period like all standards bodies have been learning for as long as we've had standards bodies the flaws in the way that they've approached problems and one of the things that's always a challenge that is not learned early enough is that when you have multi stakeholders you have so many people who rely on your uh, on your standards that somehow engaging them early in the process is important is especially important because things just take a really long time. So I've been involved in a number of different activities to try and get developers and that and by developers I I mean people generally who are outside of W3C member companies, right? Because the people that W3C uh, member companies put forward to participate in W3C activities is a very 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 small distillation of the web developer community and uh, it includes a lot of people who probably are not in the web developer community there. And, and I think that bringing the reality of the viewpoints of web developers into the process early can have a real benefit. And so initially we had this thing called incubation groups, that kind of got... Uh, it's historically new and that's kind of what I was saying. Yeah, like, yeah. It, these are positive developments. I think there are some really good examples of where community groups have incubated an idea that initially came from outside of the W3C. It came from developers. It came from uh, people who were working for companies that weren't W3C member companies um, and therefore couldn't participate in full. It was more difficult for them to participate in full W3C working groups. It is possible for organizations that are outside of or people that don't work for W3C member companies to participate in W3C working groups, but it's an arduous process. You need to become an invited expert. This is one of those kind of uh, controversial topics. I'm sure some people would say, oh, it's easy to become an invited expert. It's not easy to be, okay? But the point is that something like community groups, the whole point of those was to uh, be a place where people can bring a new idea, start talking about it amongst themselves, start developing it, and then eventually bring that idea uh, when it's more fully formed, when there is a spec, when there's something something drafty that even we might have an implementation can be brought into a full W3C community or a working group. I mean, I think one of the best examples, most recent examples of that, that um, that I've been connected to has been the immersive web community group, which was building the WebXR specification, initially the WebVR specification. And uh, that work happened initially in a community group. It incubated in that community group. Eventually it was brought into W3C, it was brought into a full W3C uh, working group. In that process, some organizations that were not part of W3C previously joined W3C. I think that's to the benefit of W3C, um, to, to, to the benefit of the W3C community. And it also continues to work as a, as a kind of um, bi-mode process, right? Where new ideas are incubated within the community group that still can have very easy access from developers outside of the W3C member companies and the work of actually standardizing, bringing the um, the more fully fleshed ideas through the standardization process happens within W3C's more formalized process within the working group. Becoming an invited expert to, say, the CSS working group or something like that, really, it, it doesn't give you any special powers either, right? No. Um, the, the CSS working group has hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of topics. So if you're lucky, you'll get a 10 or 15 minute slot someday. That is not the way that developers really can organize their time and be involved in everything. And I think that some of the interesting things that have happened have happened through opening that up to like lighter processes that also let us sort of like test things out much more quickly and, and iterate. So one of the things that I think that's been really positive is polyfills people attempting to speculatively polyfill together in the community group. Yeah. So they don't just say, here is this vague idea 
but they they try to give you something that is actually actually mapping it to the web platform itself. And one of the positive things about that is that it gets increasingly easy to say like, ah, I see the cow path. I can actually pave that path. Yeah. And, and I think that that is, is a, a really good thing that has happened. We have increasingly tried to get to where we meet developers where they are yeah. instead of saying, come to us. Be respectful of developers' time. So I've had a couple of arguments with people about how getting developers engaged in standards work is futile, futile or very difficult because developers don't have the time. Developers have day jobs. Developers get stuck under another project and then you, they disappear. I think we need to learn how to meet developers halfway, right? This is one of the reasons why I was keen to organize developer meetups around tag meetings was so that we could you know, at least get uh, sit down with developers and get some of their attention and get some of their time give them something back, which is access to, you know, uh, and, and demystifying the process uh, of how web technologies are made, bring it to them um, so that they, uh, you know, they, they don't have to expend the effort to go to TPAC or something like that. Um, and, and then I think we can do that in a virtual way too, right? Um, we can encourage developers to comment on key GitHub issues, a new, new field being talked about for the web app manifest file, uh, let's get developers aware of that. And maybe they have data that they can share. Oh, this really would work for us because uh, our our use case is X, Y, Z. And you know, we found real difficulty working with web app manifest in that use case. And we would re really love to have this new field. Um, that kind of information, that kind of insight is gold for, in, in my experience, for web standards, uh, because it's real and real developers that are working with real applications. And those applications might not be the applications that you're thinking about. You know, like uh, I, when I was, I didn't mention it, but I, I did a stint of work for UK government digital service uh, for a year. And some of the use cases uh, there, some of the kinds of web applications that were being built there are things like, I don't know, uh, car registration, or scheduling prison visit, right? Um, these are applicate or or uh, dealing with, um, with with benefits and applying for benefits. These are the kinds of uh, use cases that really matter to people, and they're very often left on the uh, outside of the room when we're in a conversation that's being dominated by commercial partners who are really just keen on uh, meeting the needs of commercial web applications and ad clicks and engagement metrics. Increasingly, we have to do like meet developers. I would say more than halfway. I would say yeah. like we need to make it really, really cater to them in, in the sense that um, it's true that developers don't have a lot of time. We need to go out and actively engage and lower the bar by one of the things that we've been that we've been doing in the tag when we review other people's work that's one of the fun functions of the tag is to review new specifications as they come out as they're being developed um, we ask specification developers to write an explainer and the explainer should be written in a way where the web developers can engage with it it's it's an explaining we often find that these explainers assume an awful lot of knowledge like uh they ex assume jump in right away about you know talking about this technology does xyz and very often we have to we have to reply back saying can you please just start from the beginning what benefit is this does this bring to users what does what is the user need that this is in service of, so that we can uh, understand how it fits into the rest of the web platform and the point uh, being that these explainers are not just for us they're not for the tag to consume they should make it clear what the benefit of this new technology is um, and, and you know who it, who it benefits. Them. You don't get a full perspective of things if you don't talk to more people. And I, I think that you can see that a lot of people don't have the same perspective, right? Um, they, like, they don't understand the problem the same way uh, because they have very different backgrounds. Well, they're bringing a different set of concerns and issues to the same problem space. We have a real, real problem with diversity of participation in these discussions, both from a perspective of the developers that are being engaged with and the people who are being put forward to participate 
um, by W3C member companies and by other other organizations uh, in uh, other places like WattWG and TC39. Um, these are organizations that are really struggling right now, and for the last few years, and and you know, and are making good efforts to try and increase the diversity. Of, and I definitely mean people from marginalized, traditionally marginalized groups, people who have been marginalized in technology discussion. So, I mean, I will give you a kind of anecdote uh, of that. Uh, you know, I am part of a group in W3C that was um, talking about, uh, it's the diversity community group, right? And one of the things that we were talking about recently was what should W3C's response be to the uh, Black Lives Matter movement, um, which by the way, is not a, a solely a US uh, thing. It is definitely international. I can say that from experience living in the UK, there's a lot of presidents of Black Lives Matter. I was on a Zoom call talking about this with a bunch of people in the W3C community, and I could see everybody's face. And I can tell you that there was not a single Black person in that call. And this was something that the that group understood as a problem and continues to understand as a problem and is wrestling with trying to in- figure out how do we encourage W3C member companies to bring more diverse people uh, to to W3C, how do we as a community reach out to more people from marginalized backgrounds uh, and communities so that we don't have this problem? So that, uh, and, and it's not just a matter of ticking a box or saying that we have diversity. We actually get better stuff out of the out of the end of the. It's not. It's not just. It is the right thing to do, and we should be doing it because it's the right thing to do. First of all, but also. You, you get better stuff out of the end of the process by uh, having more diverse communities engaged. The science really backs this up. And I was in another discussion recently that was also not very diverse. And we were talking about some privacy-related uh, technologies. Um, and once again, really, I felt it was, very, it was a very frustrating conversation to have because in some cases, or I think in most cases, marginalized groups can be some of the groups that are most impacted when you have f- pr- privacy failures on the web. If you are in a privileged category, you maybe don't care so much about your privacy, uh, right? But if you are in a marginalized uh, category, if you're LGBT, for instance, then you are going to care a lot about your privacy and what things you click on, what to put an example out there, what Wikipedia pages you go to can be a life or death situation for you, depending on where you live in the world. The, that's the kind of thing that privileged white males sitting in Silicon Valley working on a rendering engine, it's not going to be top of mind. I'm not attacking anybody, but I do think that we really need to take this seriously. And and I think the big companies that are fielding people to participate in these standards efforts are not taking it seriously enough. Uh, I would like to challenge big companies who are putting a lot of people into W3C and into other standards efforts to get serious about putting more diverse people into those teams, creating career paths for people in their engineering groups so that they're prioritizing (laughs) diversity in their engineering teams, prioritizing putting Diver- those diverse people who they who they are building up in those engineering groups into standards and prior you know pr- prioritizing uh, putting diversity and inclusion as a priority in the whole thing. In the middle of that, we also need to make sure that W three C itself, so uh, you know, as one of the organizations that is a steward of web standards, is an inclusive organization and is not a place where. The minute you, as a, a, a woman or as a black person or as somebody who is coming from a marginalized group, um, step your foot into that organization, you feel like, what the hell am I doing here? This is extremely toxic. And let me tell you, I've had that feedback from people that I that have worked for me and who I have asked to participate in a particular W3C uh, activity. And they come back to me and, and told me that they felt extremely uncomfortable because they were the only woman or they were only the only non-white person and that they found it really weird and they felt excluded. W3C needs to evolve as an organization. I can, I'm can. i very happy to say that just this year, uh, just a couple months ago now, we finally 
after years of work, we're able to publish a new code of conduct, a code of ethics and professional conduct uh, for W3C, which is much more modern and incorporates a lot of the thinking from um, modern uh, codes of conduct in the open source community and in the events community, such as the uh, Geek Feminism Guide and places like that. And that is a good first step. I think having a really modern and progressive code of conduct really helps. It took a long time. And the reason it took a long time is that there was a lot of institutional resistance and a lot of whataboutism to actually putting this kind of thing in place in W3C. We got there, now we're there, and now it's time to build on that more and use that as a way to encourage more participation. Um, another thing that we're doing, we've done it for the past few years. We've had a TPAC diversity fund. I'm really happy to say that Samsung has participated and has, has uh, contributed into that fund for the past few years. Uh, we're doing that again this year. And th what does that mean? It, it means that if you are a web developer from a marginalized group, then you can apply for money from this fund to help help fund your needs when it comes to participating in tech. So in previous years, this has meant things like uh, travel or hotel, bursary uh, cost of uh, food, you know, food uh, while you're at a meeting, that kind of thing. Um, and I know many people have taken advantage of that for previous physical meetings. In the current environment, it means more like support. There's more information about the TPAC Diversity Fund on the TPAC uh, page, on the registration page. It's a little bit more difficult to find than I would like it to be, but it is there. If you go to registration, find out. I think to Tim's famous sort of, this is for everyone thing. And I think that that's important. If it is for everyone, it needs to include everyone. Mm -hmm. It needs to include everyone because it's the right thing. Yes. But also because it is a commons and it is for everyone, it will be better for including everyone. And one of the reasons uh, is actually very pragmatic and practical, which is that your perspective on things, if everybody has the same background and the same perspective and, and, and very generally the same outlook, it is going to inherently exclude people yeah. and ideas and important things. But a thing that I struggle with personally is um, there are concrete practical arguments that you can make here to say it's important for you, basically, <laughs> that there is diversity. But somehow that also can take away from the fact that like it's the right thing to do. Yes. <laughs> right. Um, which is, is a difficult balance that I'm not sure what, honestly, the right. I, I, think, I, I think it's I try and lead with it's the right thing to do. And also it's the best thing to do. So on this point, you also mentioned TPAC, yeah. and uh, one of your one of your co tag people uh, is our friend Alice Boxhall. Yes, and last year at TPAC, she gave an excellent presentation that I'll link to in the notes. That is about things that have been innovative in society that everyone benefits from today. That came about because of including more people with more diverse abilities and needs and backgrounds. Right. I think that applies broadly. You know, uh, I think I think we all benefit from a greater web privacy, for instance, even if that privacy is, you know, if those use cases are coming from particular uh, groups that we all benefit. So so it's, it's a good lesson to learn. Some of the things that we've had to change in the web around security and privacy have to do with like actually protecting people's physical safety for a lot of us like privileged white male heterosexual like maybe we don't have like some of those same immediate concerns but then when somebody points out how that can be used they're they're more sensitive to it somehow in, in a way that is actually really beneficial to everybody i mean one of the things that we're trying to do in the tag for instance is when we are again coming back to our review process because it's one of the kind of like powers we don't it's not a formal power but it's one of the ways in which we can exert influence over the way that specs are being developed um, we're often asking people can you elaborate on the abuse scenario right like uh, this new technology that you're trying to introduce to the web how can it be abused how can how could it be abused by uh, for instance um, we had a web we had a web IOT group um, that's looking at all kinds of scenarios around Internet of Things and home automation and that kind of thing. And one of the well-documented ways in which IoT is abused is by controlling partners that misuse IoT devices to surveil their 
their spouse or their partner. And that is that is a kind of abuse scenario that is totally not accounted for, was totally not accounted for, was doing. So things that Tad did was to feed back and say, can you please uh, take into account these scenarios here? You know, it's very well documented. You can go out and read about it here. But, you know, if you're if you're coming at it from a perspective of, uh, we just want to build this great new thing. You might not be thinking about those abuse scenarios because you're not, it's not front of mind because it's not something that you've ever had to deal with. If you've got a, a, a diverse group of people coming in at the beginning, you're going to be more likely to find those scenarios and to be, and to, and to have those in your thoughts and therefore in the, in the initial set of requirements documents. So somebody is, so somebody doesn't have to raise them at the last minute and say, Hey, you forgot these incredibly important abuse scenarios. Many of us have a very protected view of the world where we're like, we're not somehow imagining the nefarious uses of things. I, I think the ambient light API was, yeah. was like a, a, a good example of that. Um, I, I, I have to be honest, like I couldn't even imagine how somebody could have used that, but it turns out you can. Or, or, or the fact that the, uh, the gyroscope can be abused, uh, can be turned into a microphone. You know? <laughs> it's amazing, right? Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. And um, I think that this is one of the things that definitely separates the web is that we are fundamentally striving. And I would say not always succeeding, sure. Like, um, but we're fundamentally striving to protect users yes, and to do that in ways that are ethical, where sometimes that means that a very large portion of developers even will think, but there's a very obvious answer here, or like, there's just a really simple thing that you can add. And it, it's less than simple or obvious in many cases. Yeah. And this is, again, why I think that like reaching reaching developers with these nuanced conversations and things is necessary. And and I think it's necessary because also discussion travels, right? So even if you can't reach like a mil, you, can, you can't speak to a million developers maybe, but you can speak to maybe 30 developers and, and those 30 developers will help you explain to 30 more developers, yeah. you know, and you can, you can get at conversations and, and difficult things that way. I should also probably take the opportunity to talk about the fact that the tag recently or last year uh, published a document called the Ethical Web Principles. And the yes. point of this document is to try to answer the question. So what is what makes the web different from other similar platforms? Why is the web different from native application? Why is the web different from any kinds of any kind of document? Why is the web? Why? What what makes the web different? What different the thing that I think a lot of us feel a lot of us who have been participating in the web community for years feel is that the web is inherently a more ethical platform, or at least it should be. It certainly was built from a perspective of uh, the web is for everyone, as you channeled Tim Berners-Lee's statement. It, it's also an, it should be an inherently safe platform to use. I mean, a lot of the statements in it take the form of things like the web should not cause harm to society. Uh, the web should must support healthy community and debate. The web is for all people. Um, that encompasses kind of internationalization, talking about security and privacy as well, and enabling freedom of expression, but not misconstruing that to mean that therefore all all commercial platforms must support all hate speech. The, uh, uh, the web must make it possible to verify information. Uh, the web is transparent and and allows users to control the rendering process. So, you know, being able to install a extension which allows you to block ads is an inherent process it's inherent quality of the web that makes it a beneficial it, it makes it, it it tips the balance in favor of the user's need as opposed to the developer's needs what makes the web a more ethical platform from the beginning then we can tie our design principles back to them so we can say okay well it's safe it must be safe to click on a link and it must be and that is because of XYZ ethical principle that is something that applies to how the web is designed and what makes it different. So that's work that is ongoing, but I, I think it's important fundamental work, a little bit of archaeology, because we went through and we 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 found, you know, things like and incorporated things like the um, priority of constituencies, you know, putting users' needs first. We incorporated that into our documents now. Um, that used to be part of this kind of 
unofficial HTML design principles note. Now it's part of our web design, uh, web platform design, which again ties back to the ethical. Goals. So let me ask a, a hard question. If you were to zoom out a little bit, and we look at the priority of constituencies and we look at the statements that we're making about doing new features or bugs to be worked out or something that is for one of those purposes that isn't done yet. You, you can make ethical arguments that we should do certain things that remain undone and that those should take some priority. And one of the things that governs this and our ability to effectively deal with this like priority of constituencies is like the way that the web is funded. <laughs> Ultimately, there is a budget somewhere. Somebody is governing with not necessarily that as their first and foremost priority, right? They have to know, can we afford to take this up? Can we afford to get it done? Is it going to ship next quarter? Do I have the resources to work on it? And that, like that, those are just practical very banal, just business things that we all have to do. And the result of that can be confusing, right? Like, I mean, you, you might be waiting for an internationalization feature or an accessibility feature, and there's an app update to an app you love, and it gets shiny new skin. And you're like, well, clearly they care about this more than they care about me. But in reality, like those are different people that would work on that. And like those people were free and the other people yeah. weren't, you know? Uh, so, so there can be like very innocent sorts of simple common reasons for this, but, but I wonder, like, I, I, this is part of a larger conversation that I've been trying to start about the web has to be bigger than individual companies and individual companies. This is a reality. Like this is a reality. Like, how can we do better? Do you have any ideas about how we can do better? Like my idea to do better is to diversify investment. Um, but there are things that are maybe ethically good to do that are just never going to be like a profit center for anybody. Having more participation by more organizations might help to diversify its trajectory to make it a little bit more of a platform that meets more than just one organization's needs. Or I think that the way that some open source projects work and the way that they define meritocracy or the way that they define merit and contribution within an open source project can also be a barrier to entry for individual developers, for, for community developers. It can be a barrier to entry because you've got to invest a huge amount of time uh, to become influential in that project. And a lot of not, work, not working for big organizations don't have that kind of time. But even web developers that are working for big organizations, they might not be working for organizations that have the same kind of model when it comes to the engineering, their engineering team. And I wonder if we need to somehow think about that, think about meritocracy in the context of how open source projects work in order to engender better participation. How can, how can, we, how can, how can we have a rethink about bringing that in, out into the open in a more um, proper open source foundation might do is to open up the door for better community participation. I can, you know, I'm thinking of a, a gov an open governance structure. You know, I wonder if that same approach couldn't be couldn't be applied with a little with with great tech. We need to have a healthy, diverse community, and this could be one approach. Open source itself is young, and I feel like it's yeah. uh, you know we're constantly reevaluating open source itself and how it works and and trying to do better. Yes. And I would expect to come along with that, like as we learn and grow. Yeah. Like I guess, like I understand why it is that way, and like it seems kind of reasonable and yet i also 100 percent expect we can do better i have hopes that it that will be good but i think it's the problem of <clears throat> somebody to invest in the implementation in the first place <laughs> for a lot of things <clears throat> um yeah i mean i think i don't know i think that's a, i i don't know if i have a good yeah no i said it it's, a, it's hard a hard problem, problem. <laughs> i think we need to look at alternate funding sources for some of these implementations you know yeah it's a thing that i'm very interested in because I think that uh, the web is a commons and the fact that it is, if you trace the money, basically it is mostly funded by search. Yes. Right? That is an, that is like kind of one extreme, like it, it's gotten us here and I, I'm not necessarily complaining about it, but um, it, it does lead to certain things and not certain other things getting, getting attention. So, so like the, the motives of who is doing things, they're not charities, right? And that's fine.
but it but it does mean that if you're talking about end users are your important thing, then you can wind up being like, well, end users of Office. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But but not end users who you know are like trying to interact with a keyboard on the regular web. That's like not that's not to bash on Office in any way. It's just like the thing that yeah my mind. yeah um, yeah. And so so like I I I mean to I mean. My point is maybe, you know, do, do other, how, how do we get other funding mechanisms involved in helping to fund those? I guess. And I don't, I also don't think it's appropriate to turn around to those people who are in, like, hey, you marginalized community, why don't you stump up the cash to uh, support this feature, you know, that, or that benefits you? That's also not appropriate, right? So, you know, could government funding uh, play a role more? We've seen that play a very important role in the creation of the internet in the first place. Um, why aren't we hearing more about government grants and that kind of thing being used to fund uh, work on, on the web? Those, those kind of things would be really positive because it is uh, like we have not actually explored any of those models. And I think that if we're in that sort of stage in our in our history, like I, I said this thing in my recent blog post where like when I was a little kid and cable television was new, <laughs> my grandmother said, <laughs> why would anybody pay for television for yeah because it just comes over the air and it's free and it's like no it's not free it is like ads in your face every 10 seconds right like i just want to be able to watch a movie on hbo and that turned out to have its own issues and we tried other things and now we have like lots of different ways to fund the creation of entertainment and i think it's better for it you know and i think that we should explore lots of different ways to fund the commons yeah. because it underpins all of society and it's important. And, and I think that's the important, that's the, that's the thing that I keep coming back to in my head is that it's not just about when we talk about the web, I feel like some people feel like we're talking about Facebook, we're talking about Netflix, we're talking about, you know, Google and ads and search and stuff like that. And, you know, the web is important to people because they, uh, it is the way that they are finding a job. It's the way that they're able to apply for benefits. It's the way that they're able to find a home. It's a way that they're able to get uh, health care. It's a way that they're able to get information about coronavirus, right? And understand whether or not they should be traveling uh, to a particular city or not. Uh, it helps them make life-changing you know, vital life decisions. The web touches every single aspect of people's lives from birth to death. And, you know, if, if we uh, only treat it as a commercial platform, that's only important from the perspective of search and ads and, and making uh, ad more ads, pay more money for, for big content and big business, then we're really doing it a disservice. And it's not, then it only becomes that commons and that socially relevant platform by accident. And I think we can't right. do that. We can't, we, the, the web needs to be more than that it needs to be by intention, this socially relevant, socially vital platform that connects us. Yeah. And, and it is that right now we need to maintain, we need to make sure that it maintains that. It's really well articulated. Yeah. So our ability to have like lots of different uh, investment in the things that are important to the commons, you know, it, it goes across all things. And I think MDN is a, uh, is an interesting example to use. And so MDN is probably like the greatest resource for web developers to ever exist. I, I think it's true. I think it is. And I, and I think, so a few years ago, I became part of the advisory board for MDN. So MDN has what's called a product advisory board, uh, which consists of people from different organizations. Uh, we, uh, we have uh, Robert Nyman from Google. We have, um, we have Dominique from W3C, uh, Jory from, from Boku. And the point of this was to reinforce what was already the case and what, what many web developers already knew, which was that MDN is a cross-browser development resource for web, for web developers, a, web, a documentation resource for web developers. And, um, and then that information flows through to Can I Use, uh, because more recently, Can I Use is now using the WebCat data. So it's all part of the same story about, about data. And as a web developer, you can be confident, you can have a fair amount of confidence that you will be able to go to any particular web page on MDN and get a very good kind of neutral uh, editorial viewpoint, um, even though it's run by Mozilla, and, and that you'll be able to use that information to, you know, to guide your work. So I've been very happy to be able to put some of my time and energy 
and also some people that are working for me at Samsung are working on updating their pages. And more recently, that group of people has come together um, because Mozilla has been having some um, challenges recently to try and figure out how we can shore up support for MDN and ensure that it maintains its role as this uh, edit neutral editorial voice uh, web documentation hub for the benefit of all web developers. I think that's super important. And it's something that I've been spending, especially in the last few weeks, a lot of my time and energy on along with uh, the other members. Yeah, it's important. I mean, it is the documentation of the commons, yes. right? I mean, it, it, it is inherently a part of the commons. It, it, it desperately needs uh, investment. And it is sort of an illustration of this earlier point that we were making about things will change. And like, even if the organization is the whole entire organization of Mozilla, they love the web. Yeah. Right? I mean, and yet we have hard challenges like this. And so I think the things that we're doing to help diversify the investment in it and, and, and work together as if it were a commons is just great. And we do yeah. more of it. Um, all right. So Dan, thanks so much for taking the time and talking with me about I, I think lots of other like different areas of things that we haven't had a chance to talk mm -hmm. about yet that I think are really important. Um, thank you. It's always interesting to chat with you, Brian, uh, this stuff. And, uh, you know, thanks also for the time and energy that you've been putting into the web platform all these years. Uh, it's really made a difference, I think. Also, thank you for everything that you have done for the web and continue to do for the web. I think that the web is uh, a better place for your involvement. So thanks.